Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage a man that I've known for several years now, uh, the Commonwealth's new Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, Mr. Jay Ash. Secretary Ash is no stranger to the industry, having previously served as city manager in Chelsea, where he worked diligently to relocate a biotech company to his city that is still thriving uh, there. So he's familiar with uh, what it is that we do and how important it is, not only to the economy, but to the patient population. He's led statewide initiatives on health insurance, youth violence, transportation infrastructure, and expanded gaming in Massachusetts. He's a wonderful human being, a great person, uh, a, a wonderful professional and someone that we were really, really excited to find out when Governor Baker uh, appointed him and, and asked him to be part of his cabinet, especially in the area of economic development, because this is the secretary that we work closest with in, in our industry. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking and welcoming Secretary Jay Ash for some comments. That's not uh, any biotech company that I uh, helped bring to Chelsea, but the biotech company of your president, Glenn Batchelor. So, um, Sevitas is in uh, Chelsea, and um, I like to take credit for bringing it to Chelsea, but it's my good friend Tommy Finneran in the back of the room who called me one day and he said, Jay, uh, I'm talking to Alchemies, and um, I'm talking to Alchemies about doing things um, outside of Cambridge, and I want to bring them over to Chelsea uh, and introduce you to Alchemies. And uh, Tom Finneran, uh, was a guy that made that happen and made so much else happen. I will tell you about 1985, and Tom, you'll appreciate this from your previous life as uh, uh, the uh, chairman of House Ways and Means. In 1985, a thing that Bob didn't mention was we were in the middle of the Massachusetts miracle. Remember the Massachusetts miracle? And I was in House Ways and Means with then uh, chairman of House Ways and Means, Richie Volk. And uh, Tom, at that time, as people were coming in, the answer to the question wasn't yes and no. The answer to the question was, well, how much do you really need? because Massachusetts was a, a wash of money. Little did I know that as a, as a young legislative staffer at age 21 um, that I was living through what was going to be the greatest time for state budgeting, and uh, we were able to give out uh, so much money to uh, seed so many things. And I was in an initial meeting um, as a mass bio uh, was being formed, and, and people came in to talk to, uh, talk to us at the State House about the opportunity. So uh, a lot of memories about uh, 1985. Uh, Bob, thank you for... Uh, uh, bringing those to our attention. So uh, I am in week 12 of uh, being the Secretary of uh, Housing and Economic Development for the state. Um, I left a great job in my native Chelsea uh, to um, be able to look beyond the 1.8 square miles that Chelsea is and I had been looking at for 50 years to be able to travel around the state and to talk to people about uh, their hopes and dreams uh, for their communities and our collective hopes and dreams for the Commonwealth. Um, I uh, got a call from a guy who I have respected for many years and uh, uh, became friendly with over the last couple of years. And when um, then Governor elect Baker called me and said, Jay, I would like you to lead our economic development effort, um, I was so excited about the opportunity uh, that I immediately said yes. And then I said to myself, oh my God, what have I done? Now, uh, many of you may know that um, I am a, a lifelong Democrat, and uh, I don't think the governor is a lifelong Democrat. Um, but that wasn't the oh my God moment, because uh, the two years that I had spent with uh, candidate Baker um, talking about our hopes and dreams for the Commonwealth, I found that uh, there was no difference in opinion, no difference in opinion about uh, what his goals and uh, dreams were for the Commonwealth in mind. So that wasn't the big difference. The big difference was a personal one. For 14 years, I have been the CEO of Chelsea. I was my own boss. I mean, think about it for those of you who are out there that are CEOs, that all of a sudden, I'm going to go to work for somebody else. And I have uh, grown uh, accustomed to my ways of doing things and um, certainly had um, not looked forward to the idea of now needing to be uh, subservient. Um, the great pleasure that I've had being a partner uh, with uh, the governor now and the lieutenant governor, uh, Karen Polito, is that um, there isn't any subservient in our cabinet discussions. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Governor Baker, Charlie Baker, um, I've been around, I've been around uh, many uh, very impressive politicians, uh, statesmen, uh, over the 30 plus years of my uh, time in government. 
and um, I have not found an individual like him. Um, I walk into the room and I automatically know who the smartest person in the room is. It's, it's Governor Baker. But what amazes me about him is that not only is he the smartest, but he's the most inquisitive. And this is what I like as a guy who was concerned about being subservient to somebody else is that uh, I feel like I'm a partner with the governor. He listens to what I have to say. Uh, he, um, he does, this, is the, this is the way the governor operates. You bring in a, a slide deck, uh, PowerPoint presentation, and you go through your PowerPoint presentation, and he's busy looking down, writing notes all the time about uh, what I'm talking about, what the presenter is talking about. You go five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes into your presentation, and then Charlie time happens. And his eyes lift up, and he starts asking questions like a guy who is a subject matter expert in the area that he uh, maybe didn't know anything about prior to the presentation. And uh, those questions are helped to, uh, meant to help uh, push the dialogue and make sure that the decision that we make collectively is the best decision uh, for the Commonwealth. More time, I've seen him twice now in cabinet meetings actually change his mind based upon, change his mind based upon uh, the input that he's received uh, from people around the table, and I say that's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Now, granted, both of them were about lunch, but <laughs> it shows a willingness to go from the veggie uh, wrap that he wanted uh, to a hamburger, and I was very impressed with that. So, um, so uh, the governor is, um, one of the things the governor has said to me, um, and it's the thing that I really want to talk about uh, to you here today, is that um, he said to me, Jay, we could come down from the mountain with the tablets and say, uh, here are our laws for the next four, eight, 12 years, and show those tablets to everybody else and say that's the way we're going to operate. The governor has said to me, and it's something that I believe deep down in my heart as well, that uh, we are doing our best to avoid that and instead are looking forward to engaging um, our stakeholders, our partners, in a, a healthier, more vibrant Commonwealth in discussion about those issues that we collectively feel are important. Just as the governor, I feel like, is the smartest person in the room and he could give a dissertation on just about any topic, uh, and yet he listens to the people that he's assembled around the room, uh, we as a government are trying to do that as well. And so instead of coming in and saying, I'm the government, I know best, to, uh, to use Bob's uh, uh, slip up here for a minute, Bob's invented nothing. Um, I led a historic economic development uh, um, agenda in Chelsea, and yet I would regularly sit across from real estate people, regularly sit across from business people, regularly sit across from investors and confide in them that I have never developed or invested in any real estate in my life. So the point here is that to be successful, you can be the smartest guy and have done everything and want to replicate it again, or you can be a facilitator uh, who reaches out and embraces uh, the smart people, the successful people um, in the domain that you want to affect and encourage and enable those people to be the, the great leaders, the great innovators, the great entrepreneurs they can be. And that's the tenet of our administration and exactly what we're attempting to do. So as we think about what our economic development agenda is, uh, I don't come to you here today with the tablets to say, this shall be the development agenda and you shall all fit into this development agenda. Instead what I want to do is I want to share with you some emerging thoughts about what we're doing and I would like to have a dialogue with you uh, over the next weeks, months and years about how our emerging development agenda should turn into something more solid that helps to promote everything that you stand for and you hope for your Commonwealth and everything that I have a responsibility uh, to deliver to 351 communities around the Commonwealth. So I'll share with you um, the, the aspects of it. Um, the first comes from my own background. So uh, as a city manager, as a guy who is really uh, specialized in, in municipalities and economic development, um, as I go around the state, what I see is that we uh, managers and mayors are not prepared for success. And a first tenet of our emerging economic development agenda is to help communities prepare for success. I do this, I'll tell you a story. So uh, those of you who may be Patriots fans out in the room, uh, you'll remember that at one time, uh, Bob Kraft was talking about moving the New England Patriots to Hartford. So as a, as a younger, uh, very ambitious uh, city manager who was interested in making a mark on his community, 
I had this great idea. I was not only going to keep the New England Patriots in Massachusetts, but I was going to bring them to Chelsea, Massachusetts. And so I worked my little uh, networking uh, uh, lines, and I got in to see Bob Kraft to talk to him about moving the New England Patriots to Chelsea. I went into Mr. Kraft and I said, I have a site of 60 acres that's right next to public transportation that's proximate to the metropolitan highway system and is in the center of the population mass of New England. Why wouldn't you want to come to Chelsea? And so he looked at the photo I brought of the 60 acres and he said, Jay, how many parcels are in those 60 acres? And I said, there are about 60. And he said, how many owners are there of those parcels? And I said, there's about 45. And Bob Kraft said to me, call me when you have the land assembled. And that was a very important lesson. Uh, John, I was talking to you about when I go to a meeting, I always try to get something out of a meeting. That was what I got out of that meeting, was you have to be prepared for success. So now to fast forward 14 years later, the FBI is coming to Chelsea. No Snickers. Yes, the FBI has come to Chelsea before, but this time we are welcoming the FBI to Chelsea. <laughs> and the FBI is coming to Chelsea and they're building a 250,000 square foot office building where 500 FBI agents will be coming to Chelsea. It's a transformative, uh, transformative project that will be a true game changer for the city of Chelsea. It's up against Route 1, so every car that drives through Chelsea, 70,000 a day, will see this transformative project uh, happening, a, a, a classic government office building that represents uh, truth, justice, and the American way. Had I gone to the GSA and said, GSA, I have a five-acre parcel that has four, four parcels, I'm sorry, I have five acres, four parcels, three owners, would you wait six years for me to assemble the land? They would have laughed me out of the room and they would have gone off and developed somewhere else. So. Point number one is that in order for communities to be able to achieve the, su the success that they can possibly have, we need to help them prepare for su that success and, and we're working towards that. Second uh, part of our uh, emerging development agenda, as I've met with some of you in the room and as I've met with uh, trade associations and businesses around the state, I am happy, very happy to report that my, the response to my question, what keeps you up late at night? What do you worry about in terms of the future and what do you need in order to enjoy a greater growth into the future has been answered almost unanimously with the same answer. Now some of us who, are, uh, who have been in government and sometimes have snide remarks about the business community would have thought that the first answer would have been we need lower taxes or would have thought the first answer would have been we need less regulation. But the first answer for every business that I've talked to, every trade association I've talked to about the future of their companies and the future of the Commonwealth has sent it around workforce. Whoever said that? Liz, was that you? All right, Liz. Workforce. And so we are focused on talent. We are focused on creating jobs, but also making sure that the talent is there to fulfill, uh, to fulfill those jobs. And so the governor has appointed a uh, cabinet level um, task force to look at workforce development from two angles. One, general work workforce development issues around education, around labor and workforce development, around economic development. And the second, looking at uh, chronically unemployed uh, individuals uh, in our state. And so we are working on the talent piece of, of making sure that when you all continue the great things that you're doing, uh, we will be able to match our workforce uh, to what you're doing. The third thing on our emerging economic development agenda refers to the second and third thing I heard from all of you, and that's taxation and regulation. So we are looking at competitiveness, and we are looking at regulatory reform, and are trying to figure out ways of dealing with high energy costs and high housing costs and um, government over-regulating uh, this, that, or the other thing. And uh, we have a separate uh, teams that are working on a regulatory reform piece and on a competitiveness issue. So that's, uh, that's happening. The third part of the uh, emerging agenda that we have uh, is regulatory reform. The fourth part of the emerging agenda we have is my, is my biggest surprise. 
So I, I, uh, I'm at events. Last night, the Chelsea Chamber of Commerce recognized me for uh, my many years of service at Chelsea. And the question over and over again from all my friends is, you know, what are you learning different? What, what's surprising you? And so here's the surprise, and I appreciate this is not meant to be a joke. Um, I always knew that higher ed in Massachusetts did a great job educating our uh, young people. And I knew they were involved in education somehow. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, in the economy somehow. You know, eds and meds, I've heard about it, and it was an important part of it. I had not realized for all these years how important higher education is to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts economic development strategy. I'm talking about publics. Tom Tremor is here from UMass and privates. Um, I've had a chance to meet with uh, the MITs of the world, and as a, a Clark University guy from Worcester, it's tough to me. It's tough for me to say good things about WPI, but I will say that I've met with WPI, and, and um, it's just great things that are happening. Um, the folks who are doing economic development work in higher education, and many of you who are supporting them, are making my job, will make my job easier. And so enabling higher ed uh, to do more, um, helping provide the resources, the leadership, um, for, so that they can go out, we can collectively uh, chase after the emerging this or provide the workforce uh, for that um, is an important piece. Fifth part of our emerging economic development agenda is specific to the competitiveness, and that's housing. Uh, you can't have a discussion in Massachusetts about the future of economic development without talking about housing. So uh, we need to do more on affordable housing. We need to do more on workforce housing. We need to do more on, on housing production in general. Uh, I've had conversations with businesses that have said to me, Jay, I'm, I'm confident that my business will work here, but I'm not confident that my employees can afford to live here. And I need to be able to address that, uh, that matter. The last of my uh, six points, and then uh, uh, I think I'll ask Bob to, uh, to come on up. The last of my six points of our emerging economic development agenda uh, refers to you, and it refers to other business persons uh, out in the Commonwealth. Um, we have a need to make sure that our high growth sectors continue to be high growth sectors. And it would be foolish for me to stand up before you and say after 12 weeks, of being the economic development director. I have come up with an economic development agenda that does not include life sciences in it. So no, we are not going back to basket weaving as our top, uh, uh, top sector that we're chasing after. Agriculture is important to us, but that's not going to be where we're putting all our, our time. You all have contributed to the number one sector in Massachusetts in the greatest life science sector cluster anywhere in the world. And for anyone in my position to stand up and say to you that we don't value what you're doing, we don't want to partner with you to see that expand, we don't believe in the power that you all exhibit on not only the economy, which is, hey, by the way, great, but on the world and making people, people healthier and, and, um, and able to live more enjoyable lives would be foolhardy. So the sixth emerging point of our, of our emerging economic development st uh, strategy is about promoting high growth industries, high growth sectors. But having said that, I also know you can't rest on that which you're in number one today because it's very easy uh, for that to go away. I always think about the guy who bought the last typewriter repair shop in the world, saved up his money, worked hard, got it all together and said, you know what, I'm going to make a business investment and I'm going to go and I think I'm going to buy a typewriter repair shop. And then all of a sudden, the computer comes along. Um, we can't rest on just supporting our high growth, our successful high growth. We have to figure out who the emerging, where the emerging sectors are. And so we're working uh, with uh, thought leaders in education. We're, we're working with uh, business communities to think about what the emerging sectors are, and we want to be significant players in those emerging sectors because we want to be number one in life sciences, but we want to be number one in a lot of other things too. And third and last, and then I'll shut up, is that uh, having grown up in Chelsea, uh, having been uh, in a place where um, manufacturing was important, where uh, retail trade was important, uh, frankly, where uh, scraps was a, a centerpiece of, of our of our economy. I, I uh, tell people all the time that if you think about MGM, I was out in Springfield, Mr. Speaker, I was out in Springfield uh, two days ago for the groundbreaking of the MGM uh, casino in Springfield. 
MGM, the second M in MGM is Louis Mayer. Louis Mayer made his first million dollars in scraps in a city called Chelsea. So the traditional economies uh, that we have supported and that have been the backbone of this uh, Commonwealth is also something um, on our agenda. So we are working on uh, strategies that address both the, uh, the, all three, the high growth, the emerging growth, and the traditional um, economies of Massachusetts. I am very encouraged by what I see out in, uh, in, in places beyond 128. We all know how special a world is uh, inside of 128 has. I'm encouraged to see that there are opportunities outside of 128. I'm encouraged with the partnerships that have been offered to us by uh, legislative leaders. Um, I am absolutely thrilled with the relationship we have with the federal government. I had the chance to sit with Senator Warren last week and both of us um, talked about our, our hopes and dreams and they, they align uh, greatly together. Um, I'm most excited about the partners and the stakeholders in our success that have come up to me and say, Jay, we want to continue to work with the Commonwealth. We want to continue to see Massachusetts be a leader in life sciences and all other things uh, that are important to this world. And I stand here before you to tell you that uh, we are prepared uh, to accept the challenge of making sure that Massachusetts moves forward and together we will have um, every bit of success uh, that we should have in doing that. So um, I uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this and the last thing that I will say to you is that um, when I have a question about life sciences uh, and I cannot answer that question on my own, I know that there's one place uh, that I can call uh, for that answer and that's the place right here, MassBio. Uh, what I have learned, what I have experienced, and again, going back to my uh, Tommy Finneran relationship with uh, bringing Alchemies uh, um, over to uh, Chelsea, is that um, when it comes to promoting our life sciences industry, uh, nobody does it better than Mass, uh, than Mass Bio. And the thing that I am lucky to have as being the, um, uh, the Director of Economic Development in the Commonwealth is that um, there are so many thought leaders and the infrastructure is here for me to tap into. And uh, Mass Bio is, is uh, one of the uh, players in this industry uh, that um, can be counted on over and over and over again uh, to be able to deliver the goods. So uh, when I have questions, uh, Bob Coughlin has been uh, so generous in, in, uh, in the last 11 weeks uh, to answer those questions. And, and Bob, to you and to everybody else that's involved in MassBio, um, I want to tell you that I appreciate um, all that you've done and I look forward to the extension of our partnership. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. We know that you're short on time, so we're going to keep running with the program. We really, really appreciate uh, your open-door po policy. We look forward to working with both you and Governor Baker and the entire administration as we continue the dialogue. And I'm sure that all the folks here uh, are appreciative and, and comforted by the fact that they know that you guys are really uh, working diligently to continue to move the Commonwealth forward, not, not only in life sciences, but all of our emerging sectors. So we Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, say one more thing. I thought you were going to ask me a question, so I want to address the life sciences. Do you want to ask that? Or, uh? Well, no, you address it. So, uh, first of all, Bob said uh, short on time. Nobody's ever called me short on anything, Bob. So, uh, Look at this, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, one, uh, one other thing that I, I, um, I, I should, uh, should address is that um, there have been um, reports out um, amongst, uh, uh, amongst man, uh, many outlets about uh, my thought, our thought, about the Mass Life Sciences Center and about uh, what our uh, thoughts are about um, Mass Life Sciences Center and other quasi-publics and, and the need to uh, consolidate or, um, or look at uh, what they do. So um, I want to just uh, share a thought with that. First of all, any scientists in the room? <laughs> I, was hoping, I was hoping I'd get that, so many scientists in the room. Um, how many scientists have gone from uh, one company to the other and when they go to the second company they accept everything that the previous scientists were doing in that company and decided to go from there? Raise your hand if that's the strategy. Nobody's going to raise a hand because you'll never get hired in another job. I'm an economic development scientist. The governor is a, um, is a uh, CEO of the economic development scientist. Um, we're, um, we're new to uh, this uh, part of, of administering government. And as scientists, um, our job is to show up and question everything that's been done before us. And um, an argument could be made that this governor was elected to do exactly that. And so as scientists, we're showing up and we're testing every 
theory, um, and frankly, every law that's been put before us about the way that economic development is done uh, in Massachusetts. So as we stand and test these things, uh, we look out around a, uh, across a broad array of economic development functions, and we see that there are 19 quasi-public agencies that are doing something relative to economic development in the Commonwealth, and we ask ourselves, is 19 the right number? Should it be seven? Should it be 25? And what you get from us, um, and I want you to hold us to this, is as we ask that question, we're going to ask you that question. So we're not going to sit back in our room and say, you know, it should be eight. Let's pick a number. It should be eight. And we're going to fit into eight. What we're going to do is we're going to go out and talk to people about, should it be 19? And what we're going to do is we're going to start a dialogue, which is going to result in us getting uh, to a good point. I will tell you that I'm very proud of the work that the Mass Life Sciences Center does. Um, I wish Susan Wyndham Bannister was here. Um, she is not just yet. She may be here later. I will tell you that the Commonwealth has been well served and has been very fortunate to have Susan at the helm of the Mass Life Sciences Center. Uh, you all have had a chance to work with her. Um, you all, uh, together with her, have uh, produced spectacular results here in Massachusetts. My job is to figure out if that's the formula for success for the next 10 years. And if not, what should we do different? What can we do different? What's our competition doing? What do we have to look out at on the horizon and figure out how to respond to? So we're engaged in that discussion. And if some of you have heard that we're looking at mass life sciences and have gotten concerned that all of a sudden the Commonwealth is reversing its course on life sciences, I want to make sure that it's clear to you as you leave today that that is the furthest from the truth. Instead, what we're doing is trying to figure out how to perpetuate the good thing and how to make sure that the Mass Life Sciences Center is set up to continue to enjoy the success with you as we go forward. That may be that we have an Uber agency. I don't think that's the way it's going to go, but I'm open to your suggestions. It may be that we leave 19 alone. It may be that we split off and, and Life Sciences does, you know, farmer and something else. We're going to figure that out. We're going to figure that out together. And this guy standing right next to me is a partner in that discussion and will help shape the policy uh, that is going to happen going forward. What you, what you should know is that the commitment has stayed the same. And in fact, what we're looking to do is to perpetuate a good thing. So if anyone has um, a, an opinion they want to share with me, I encourage you to do so. What you should know is that if we are to make a move on life sciences, if we are to make a move on tech collaborative, if we are uh, to make a move on the other quasis, it's because we see a path to take advantage of the combined resources to get a greater return on investment for our state tax dollars and for the, the effort and the uh, capital that you put into everything. Uh, so I hope that addresses um, some question. And again, I'm, I'm open for any discussion uh, that um, uh, we should have about what the future could be. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. That's wonderful. We truly, truly appreciate your time, energy, and, and you've been a pleasure to work with, and we look forward to, to continuing the dialogue.